Our moderator here is Sonia Crux, who is the Danforth Professor of Politics at Oberlin College. She was born in London, educated at the University of Leeds and London School of Economics. She's been very active in anti-apartheid activities, early 70s, Committee for Freedom, and she went off to Mozambique uh, in the 70s to teach at the Eduardo Monlan University. It's my pleasure to present Professor Sonia Crux. Well, welcome back, all of you. Can you, can you hear me? Is this? No. Is that better? Yeah. All right. <laughs> mm. OK. Um, yes, so I'm very pleased to be here today because this event, in some ways, ties two parts of my life together, an earlier life um, when I was very much involved with solidarity work with Southern Africa and when I went to Mozambique, and a later life teaching at Oberlin College, where, as some of you know, I teach political theory from Plato onwards and don't get to talk a whole lot about Africa. Uh, so it's very nice to weave, weave the two together. Um, I'm the only person, I think, on the program so far today who did not know Eduardo Mondlane, and I wish I had. Um, I went out to Tanzania for the first time in the early 70s after he had already been assassinated. Uh, but it's perhaps also indicative of the way that the program is going to shift in this session that I didn't know him, uh, because this session is going to focus less directly on Eduardo Mondelan himself, though I think he's going to be a very pervasive presence in it. But what we're going to be looking at more is really what has been going on in Mozambique since independence, the history of that country since independence, and questions about um, where is Mozambique going? How do we evaluate what's going on in Mozambique now? Uh, we have three speakers. Um, John Saul, who is from social and political science at York University at, in Ontario. Um, Edward Alpers at the end, who's in the history department at UCLA. And Janet Mondlan, who many of you heard talking briefly already this morning, um, who lives in Maputo and is the founder of the Eduardo Shivambo Mondlani Foundation. Um, and each of them is going to speak for somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes, and then we will open up the session for discussion and oh, questions. And I think, yeah. Before we get started, it just occurs to me that uh, we should be aware of and introduce our guests from Mozambique. We have nine students, or six of us from Mozambique. Yes, indeed. So our first speaker is going to be John Saul, and I was trying to think how to introduce John, and it seems to me the best thing to describe him as is as a scholar activist. Um, he has been involved with Frelimo and Mozambique, both in terms of political practice and in terms of scholarly work, um, 
for well over 30 years, I would say. I hate to think. Yeah. Right. Uh, so John taught in Dar es Salaam in the 1960s, and that's when he, I think, got to know Eduardo. Um, after independence in the mid-1980s, he went back to Mozambique itself and taught both at the Frelimo School there and at the Eduardo Mondlane University. Um, in between those two, he was very active in solidarity work in Canada. Um, he was a founder of the Toronto Committee for the Liberation of the Portuguese Colonies. That later became um, what I always refer to as Ticklesack. Um, the Toronto Committee for the Liberation of Southern Africa, and I think is still involved with that. He's on the editorial board of Southern Africa Report, um, which publishes out of Canada. Um, so I think he's really combined always a, a scholarly interest and a tremendously committed interest in Mozambique. And I want just to mention a couple of his major publications, and then I'm going to hand over to John, and I think I will introduce Ned and Janet just before they speak, because you won't remember as there are kind of longer, longer talks here than this morning. Um, John was asked to write an introduction for the new reissue of Eduardo Mondlane's book, The Struggle for Mozambique, which was, it was republished in 1983, and John wrote a quite major introduction for that. Um, a couple of years later, in 1985, he wrote a book called A Difficult Road, The Transition to Socialism in Mozambique. And he has a book that is in progress, I think, nearly, nearly finished, nearly out? Halfway. Halfway, all right. Anyhow, the title of the book is the same as the title of his talk, um, What is to be Learned, The Rise and Fall of Mozambican socialism. So I hand you over to John Saul. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Before I launch my, into my uh, formal presentation, I should say how pleased and honored I feel to, feel to be here this weekend. And I want to thank Al McQueen in particular, but his team as well. Uh, for making this whole event such a success and most importantly from me, my point of view when we were colleagues there in the 1960s and later joined me as a co-contributor to the volume, the reissue of uh, Eduardo Manlan's book, The Struggle for Mozambique. I did write an introduction but Herb wrote a very moving and important uh, biographical sketch of Eduardo which I would recommend uh, that, you, that you read. The book is not in print but I'm sure the better libraries and I was told the Oberlin Library is among them. Uh, does, have, uh, does have a copy of this book. And of course, Ned Alpers on the panel is an old neighbor of mine from the hill in Dar es Salaam, and Prexy Nesbitt, my friend, but also one of my great heroes who has probably done as much as anyone, more than most by a long shot, to uh, support and, and accompany the struggles of, of Mozambicans over the years. So this is a, a very important occasion for me. I, uh, Ed, uh, uh, um, George Hauser, rather, um, stole one of my lines that I was going to start with, but I will repeat it because I think it is important. Many people of a certain generation will remember exactly where they were when JFK, when they heard the news that JFK had been assassinated. I do remember very clearly where I was on the day that I heard, or the moment that I heard, that Eduardo had been assassinated. I was in Dar es Salaam where he was assassinated, of course. I can remember coming under the archway of the old, under the old administrative administration offices onto the main campus when somebody stopped me and, and told me of this. And I can still feel, really, when I evoke it, it's not, a difficult, it's not an easy thing for any of us, I think, to talk about. I can still feel a chill of terror and regret just mentioning that day. But countering that chill is the warmth I derive from the fact that I was honored to have known Eduardo, although not nearly as well as some others who are here. Uh, and I did have the honor as well, subsequently, to teach at the University Eduardo Manlan, uh, named after Eduardo, of course. I have a little difficulty uh, adding to my resume the fact that at the university I was teaching in the Facultad du Marxismo Leninismo. Uh, it's not an easy thing to put on your CV uh, uh, in this day and age. Uh, but th uh, that, that aside, uh, I should say that I feel uh, here to be among family, and not just Janet and Eddie and Chud, and the, immediate, the immediate family, but this larger family that I think is gathered for this occasion. What I've done is, is to take some themes from the book that I, as, as Sonia has said, I think she shares some of these same difficulties of the CV, weren't you in the Departmental de 
materialismo historico or something like that. <laughs> uh, uh, so th 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 these are... I write, it, I write it down as Marxist philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an earlier epoch that we're talking about in Mozambican history. So uh, um, anyway, this book that I'm currently working on, What is to be Learned, The Rise and Fall of Mozambican Socialism, I'm going to try and draw upon some of those themes, but also make reference to them uh, in, in the context of some of the discussion that we've already had. Uh, about Eduardo Monlan and his place in, in Mozambican history. Um, however tempting an exercise it may be when contemplating the abrupt removal from the historical process of so exemplary and important a person as, as Eduardo Monlan, speculation as to what might have been had he lived is likely to be an exercise of only limited value. In the present case, it's true even for the analysis of the pre-independence period in which Eduardo both made his political contribution and also died. The tensions within Ferlimo that were mentioned uh, earlier in some of the discussion had been temporarily papered over at the 1968 Congress, but they were far from uh, being resolved. Indeed, they may even have helped produce Eduardo's assassination, probably did. Had he lived, would he have been able to finesse the Cavandames and the Samangos more deftly and resolve more amicably the key strategic questions that were dividing the movement? And if this were not possible, and I rather doubt that it was, given what was at stake and the uh, roles being played by various actors, would he at least have been able to orchestrate the rising ascendancy of those directly linked to the military wing of the movement and to the dynamics of popularly rooted guerrilla struggle in a positive manner on at least two fronts, to have allowed the military struggle to advance successfully, as of course it did, while also ha have helped to preempt the dangers of hierarchy and authoritarianism that the necessary militarization of the Mozambican struggle seems in retrospect to have carried with it. So those are questions related to the, to the earlier period, the period of the armed struggle, but if these are impossibly speculative concerns, how much more so are questions about what might have been had Eduardo lived to usher Mozambique into independence? True, this latter question has not failed to be asked, and it has not been debated merely as a matter of academic speculation either. It has actually been from time to time the stuff of post-independence political propaganda and electoral sloganeering. Renamo itself having attempted from time to time to claim for itself and away from Ferlimo the mantle of Monlan. That is the mantle of Eduardo Monlan, the good Mozambican nationalist, the nationalist who would not have been a communist, in quotes, as Samora Michel and his most immediate political entourage most of whose members, I should say, of course, were Eduardo's own most immediate colleagues and protégés had proven to be. We have, of course, the countervailing evidence of one of Eduardo's last political statements, preserved on tape by Aquino de Braganza, from which tape I myself transcribed it and subsequently translated it into English, and I quote, I am now convinced that Ferlimo has a clearer political line than ever before, and this is now 1968, not the 1963 that Elliot Skinner was mentioning this morning, and I think it's in train with the kind of uh, notion that Prexy was putting forward about Eduardo's own growth. Uh, anyway, I'm now convinced that Ferlimo has a clearer political line than ever before. The common basis that we had when we formed Ferlimo was hatred of colonialism and the belief in the necessity to destroy the colonial structure uh, and to establish a new social uh, uh, and to establish a new social structure. But what type of social structure, what type of organization we would have, no one knew. No, some did know, some did have ideas, but they had rather theoretical notions that were themselves transformed in the struggle. Now, however, there is a qualitative transformation in thinking that has emerged during the past six years, which permit me to conclude that at present Ferlimo is much more socialist, revolutionary, and progressive than ever, and that the line, the tendency, is now more and more in the direction of socialism of the Marxist-Leninist variety. Why? Because the conditions of life in Mozambique, the type of enemy which we have, does not give us any other alternative. I do think, without compromising for Lima, which still has not made an official announcement declaring itself Marxist-Leninist, I can say that Ferlimo is inclining itself more and more in this direction because the conditions in which we struggle and work demand it. As Eduardo continued in the same interview, it would be, quote, impossible to create a capitalist Mozambique because, quote, it would be ridiculous to struggle for the people to struggle to destroy the economic structure of the enemy and then reconstitute it in such a way as to serve the enemy, close quote. 
And he also stressed the importance of learning from the, quote, concrete experience, including the errors of the socialist countries, which since 1917 have worked and lived the socialist experience, close quote. As I pointed out in my introduction to that new edition of Eduardo's book back in the early 1980s, these statements seem to reflect accurately the most positive strand of ideological development within Fulimo during the period of armed struggle, the strand which became dominant in the struggle for control of the movement after Eduardo's death. It is a strand exemplified in a recent interview by one of Eduardo's protégés, George Rebello, who was a Politburo member of Fulimo in the early years of independence, and I quote, we all agreed that we were going to gain independence but this was not the ultimate object. That was in fact the creation of a progressive society which would bring an end to misery in our country. This was not a mere slogan. It was inside of us." Close quote. As Rebello continued, quote, we can't help but be shocked by the distance between that which, our, what, that which was our objective and what is the reality today. A comment that raises issues to which I'll return momentarily. Here it's important to affirm that this strand of progressive ideological development is also eminently consistent with, in fact it is a further extrapolation from, themes already developed in Eduardo's book. Of course, just what Eduardo thought to be conveyed by the term Marxism-Leninism, what he might have seen to be the quote errors of the socialist countries, and how his continued reflection on such matters might have played into Ferlimo's post-liberation practice are things we can never know nor can we know whether such reflection by him might have spared for Limo some of the policy errors it undoubtedly did make in pursuit of a socialist future for Mozambique. Not that it is easy to decide what weight such errors themselves had in defining the ultimate failure, or was it a defeat, of the Mozambican socialist project. Indeed, one of the great debates that attends current, uh, current, cur that attends current scholarly contemplation of the rise and fall of Mozambican socialism is precisely the relative weights to be attached to the project's own inherent weaknesses as against the overbearingly negative impact of the hostile environment in which the project was being mounted. Self-evidently, that hostile environment expressed itself most proximately through the sustained program of straightforward destabilization inflicted upon Mozambique by first Rhodesia and then South Africa, with whatever other shadowy forces were in the wings. Beyond that, there was the hostile environment of, the, of global capitalism, albeit a global capitalism reinforced in its economic workings after 1980 by the Reaganite political strategy of rollback. It is easier to see now than it was in the mid to late 1970s, which after all witnessed a high watermark for anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist forces in Vietnam in Nicaragua and elsewhere, just how difficult it was increasingly going to be to get away with committing a socialism anywhere in the world, let alone in the southern Africa of South Africa's, of South Africa's Reagan-friendly total strategy. Still, errors there also were. Errors in the sphere of social and economic policy, where despite, despite dramatic gains in health and education, and even to some extent in gender policy, for example, a transformative economic prog program never quite got off the ground. Undeterred by the weaknesses of inherited institutions for the purposes they now envisaged, and despite a lack of trained cadres, Ferlimo entered into the post-independence fray, driven by a certain cocky overconfidence carried over from the heroic days of armed struggle. Listen once again to Georges Rebello, who recalled leaving a meeting at the Ponte Vermelha of Palace just after independence and having President Michel say, now we have the power and we can finish with misery in Mozambique in two years. Someone said, no, two years is too short a time. And Michel replied, okay, three years then. <laughs> we have to say now, Rebello continued, that this was a bit of volunteerismo, volunteerism on our part. We were imagining things that in reality were not possible, but that's what we wanted to do." Close quote. Ferlimo's hand was also forced by the precipitate departure of the Portuguese to nationalize things more quickly and more sweepingly than they might otherwise have done. In addition, a considerable price was paid by Ferlimo for associating its project, for good reason and bad, I hasten to say, 
too closely to a particular kind of socialist theory and practice, to the Marxist-Leninist variant proffered by comrades from the then Eastern Bloc, with its errors, be it noted, seldom mentioned, something I actually learned for myself at close hand while teaching with such so-called comrades. They weren't particularly comradely towards me in the Faculty of Marxism-Leninism at Eduardo Milan University. Here was a vision, this particular version of Marxism-Leninism, that sanctioned a high-tech definition of economic transformation, the importance of the forces of production, don't you know? Big projects, tractors, and the like. And equally faithfully, as not being quite proletarian enough, an underestimation of the importance of the peasants, not least economically, to the transformation of Mozambique. By the time Ferlimo began to learn from its mistakes and understand that subtler transformative policies were more appropriate to its socialist goals, a guarded use of the market mechanism for certain purposes, for example, and a more positive embrace of peasant participation in economic development, the escalation of destabilization and of Western containment policies had begun to shut the door on such possibilities. By now, a full-scale and uncritical retreat to the market, worldwide and local, and unqualifiedly neoliberal in its auspices, was all that seemed open to Ferlimo, a condition of such relief from the burden of debt as might be forthcoming, a condition of any Western facilitating of the peace process. It's not, however, the task of this presentation to evaluate the neoliberalization of Mozambique that has been attendant upon the peacemaking process in that country, country and that continues to define current policies there. Without downgrading for even one moment the importance to the lives of ordinary Mozambicans of the fact of peace, fact of peace so valuable in its own right, that was achieved once in Chester Crocker's immortal words, the Ferlimo leadership had abandoned its, quote, Afro-Marxist fantasies, close quote, and without seeking to tread on the ground allotted on this panel to the presentation regarding such matters by my old friend and former colleague Ned Alpers, I will only say that my hunch is to agree with the analysis presented a few years ago by the American economist David Plank. For the latter argues, his article appeared in the Journal of Modern African Studies, that Mozambique is now experiencing a particularly dramatic form of what he calls recolonization, and one potentially even more pervasive and difficult to shake off than was the Portuguese version of colonialism. Can we at least ask how Eduardo Monlan might have fared on these heavy seas of destabilization and rollback and recolonization? As stated earlier, there are diminishing returns to efforts to speculate about such a question. Still, one must suspect that he would have been pushing, for reasons already discussed, to find room for maneuver within the global economy, within the region, and within the damaged economy and society left behind by the Portuguese in Mozambique itself to advance more rather than less progressive, even socialist policies to meet the needs of ordinary Mozambicans. In short, no contemporary image of Eduardo Manlan as neoliberal avant la lettre, whether that image be wielded by spokespersons of Renamo or as is quite conceivable nowadays by spokespersons of Ferlimo, can really stand up to close scrutiny. This may be of some significance. As we know, it would be naive at this late date to argue that the era of the old Ferlimo state, a left developmental dictatorship with deeply flawed economic and social policies, did not have its grievous flaws. Nonetheless, reflecting on the first 20 plus years of Mozambican independence, years marked most recently by destabilization, by internal war, and by peacekeeping, one could still, uh, peacemaking rather, in quotes, one could still conclude with the observation that what has been lost most visibly from the liberation struggle itself, but also from the earliest period of post-independence Mozambican history is something terribly important. It is precisely the loss of too much of the sense of social and public purpose that once prevailed, a purpose premised on the envisaging of society-wide transformations that could actually change the lives of the vast majority of Mozambicans in positive ways. That such commitment to the collective wheel has been lost will bring no tears to the eyes of a Chester Crocker, perhaps. But the fact remains that its loss has been the price both of the kind of war inflicted on Mozambique 
and of the kind of peace achieved there. If development in any meaningful sense is ever to occur in their country, Mozambicans will eventually have to rediscover just such a sense of purpose, I think. And in doing so, they will have to rediscover, among other things, something of the socialist legacy of Eduardo Manlan. But what finally about another question of contemporary resonance? What about the question, Monlan the Democrat? Question mark. No less speculative than the question, Monlan socialist or neoliberal, this question does nonetheless provoke thoughts about post-independence Mozambique, not least in its socialist phase, that carry us onto a especially interesting analytical terrain. For in retrospect, it might be argued that insofar as Mozambique's future lay in Ferlimo's own hands at the moment of independence, the most fundamental flaw in its project, even more fundamental than its weakness in the sphere of economic policy making, was precisely its weakness in the sphere of democratic theory and practice. Not that Ferlimo ignored this issue altogether. Indeed, the Ferlimo leadership reveled in the fact that a great deal of its military success came from listening to and working with people on the ground as the movement advanced its armed struggle, something I witnessed for myself when I visited the liberated areas in 1972 of Tet province with Ferlimo guerrillas during the war there. Moreover, one of its most dramatic policy initiatives in the very first days of its holding power was the attempt to deepen the populace's own sense of fundamental empowerment through the establishment of the Grupo Stinamizadores in urban neighborhoods, rural villages, and in workplaces. But the messiness of such democratic processes in the making did not appeal to those used to the military order orderliness of Nachinguea camp. It proved all too easy for Ferlimo leaders in their arrogance of power, albeit often, at least in the early days, with the very best of intentions and full commitment to the popular cause, to convince themselves that they knew best and absolutely what was required. However, this was an organ moreover, this was an organizational trajectory that the adoption of official Marxism-Leninism with its stern Stalinist rationale for vanguardism and its firm sense of historical certainty could only reinforce. For the fact remains that opposition was often merely crushed and that mass organizations, the women's organization, the trade unions and the like, ostensibly created as mechanisms of popular empowerment, all too quickly became more like transmission belts for delivery of the party line. Critical debate that should have been the lifeblood of the revolutionary process all but dried up in a stale and predictable media. Tradition, in quotes, seen to have its negative side in spheres like gender relations and exaggerated deference to old style authority, religious conservatism, and ethnic and regional sensitivities became, as examples of obscurantismo, only so many negative constraints to be overridden from on high, rather than being uh, viewed as the deep-seated social realities they were, to be worked upon politically, balancing leadership against mass, in mass initiatives in much more nuanced and open-ended ways. At its most grotesque, this tendency was revealed in the, quote, solution to problems of urban overcrowding that became opera sao produção. Here was a prime example of a, kind of, trans of, of a kind of transformative tactics that in their negative impact would ultimately provide hostages to Renamo and also help to rot out much of the high moral purpose that had originally inspired for Limo. This is not to be wise after the event. Writing in the early 1980s, in, an in the introduction we've already referred to, to the new edition of Eduardo's book, The Struggle for Mozambique, I had already evoked such thoughts, seeing them as, as being relevant, as relevant to contemplating the then still somewhat open future of Mozambican socialism as they now may be to writing that socialist experiment's epitaph. I noted a number of, quote, danger signs that threatened the vigor of the emancipatory process that Ferlimo professed to value, including considerable, quote, inertia in facilitating mass action and self-organization by the workers and peasants, quote, the overvaluing of top-down interventions and administrative solutions, and, quote, the adoption of an official Marxism whose sterile definitions could serve to deaden Marx's emancipatory message. Such tendencies seem to me to cut against the profoundly democratic thrust both of Eduardo's book and of his political proclivities more generally. As I then wrote in concluding my introduction, Monlan's own socialist 
even Marxist-Leninist premises, as expressed to Bragantz in the interview I cited above, remained, quote, framed by his book, by its insistence that Ferlimo's political project cannot exist outside of or above the Mozambican people itself. And that, quote, as long as the sensibility that informs Monlan's book remains at the center of Ferlimo's practice, there's a strong likelihood that the country's goals will be achieved, close quote. Once again, we cannot say for a certainty what would have become of Eduardo's own highly developed democratic sensibility under the pressures that sprang from the kinds of regional conflagration, institutional disorder, and economic difficulty that his successors had to face not to mention from the temptations of power that's ensnared so many of his African counterparts to go no further afield. What we can say is that these successors, the Ferlimo leadership, did not manifest nearly enough of this democratic sensibility in their socialist years, or more recently for that matter. As a number of the old militants from that period have confessed quite ruefully to me in recent interviews. To be sure, it is difficult to isolate out this one factor, the failure of democratic sensibility from all the other relevant variables. Nonetheless, the costs of its absence were probably quite high. Of course, even if this point is granted, it does not follow that the formal democratic institutions now in place in Mozambique are any more empowering for ordinary Mozambicans than were the political structures established by socialist Ferlimo. Thus, for me, there was a particularly sad irony in the recent observation of a Mozambican friend a journalist and a firm supporter of freedom, not least of the press, in his country. He wished for no return to the bad old days of government dictation of the party line to his newspaper. Yet he confessed he cannot escape the feeling that the workers and peasants in Mozambique had actually had more power under the old Ferlimo regime. Then, he said, the leadership took their interests more seriously even if it never found ways to institutionalize a genuinely popular democracy in any very effective way, and their voices were actually heard more clearly than they are now uh, under, ne under liberal democracy. In the present system, their votes are merely canvassed in a competitive manner that has little to do with advancing their life chances or helping them to clarify their socioeconomic options, and in that context, it may be no accident that in the recent Mozambican election, only 15% of the population voted in local government elections. This is a, a system that has moved away from people uh, in, in many ways, and, and much further in some ways, it seems to me, than previously, whatever other virtues there are to the current moment in Mozambique. Thus, perhaps the witches brew that the potent combination of formal liber formerly liberal democratic institutions and socioeconomic recolonization can produce, a proof that even if the existence of multi-party elections is one necessary condition for democratizing a country, it is very far from being a sufficient one. Hearken then to contemporary efforts to rebuild the Mozambican polity from the ground up, to help empower civil society, not least those of its members who are among the poorest of the poor, to, make the kinds of to help them to make the kinds of demands on the Mozambican state that may ultimately force it to recover something of its former social vision, a vision of, among others, Eduardo Manlan, as I've argued above. It is no accident that two widows of two former presidents of Ferlimo, martyrs both, are engaged in just such work. I speak, of course, of Grassa Michelle and Janet Monlan. In their work, and in the work of others in Mozambique, similarly engaged, can we doubt that we hear, hear echoes of the voice, the democratic voice, of Eduardo Monlan? Thank you. <laughs>